In the previous video we moved from double slits to multiple slits. In this video we're going to take another step along and look at diffraction gratings. Now a diffraction grating, um, uh, as I said, is just sort of the continuation of multiple slits uh, in that it contains a lot more uh, slits, um, usually referred to as lines when we start to have so many of them. Uh, sort of the, the, the term that gets used is lines rather than dealing with the slits. Um, and they contain um, very large numbers of slits and um, those slits are parallel and they're evenly spaced. Um, and as I said uh, the term that gets used here uh, is often more uh, lines than it is slits um, and when we're talking um, a large number we're talking in the vicinity of 600 lines per millimeter. Now the number of lines will vary depending on the application, depending on the wavelength of the, the uh, light that's being used, uh, but that's just a, a bit of a rough indication as to how many lines we're talking. So imagine in one millimeter uh, that you're going to fit 600 lines in there. Um, and because they have many more lines, um, we end up seeing uh, that pattern that we saw with multiple slits continuing, um, and that is that um, the intensity maxima, so both the central maximum and the other um, nth order maxima, uh, they will um, follow, as I said, that same pattern, and that is that they become narrower, so they're very narrow, and also have a very high um, uh, peak intensity. So continuing that pattern, as I said, um, and um, the other thing that's common though is that um, they're still modulated by single slit diffraction. So like I said, taking um, another step along the, the, uh, the, the trend um, with uh, the same sort of idea occurring, just with uh, a larger number of um, lines. To uh, make it a little bit more sense of um, the interference pattern that's produced, we're going to take a step backwards and look at double slit interference first. Uh, so this relates to uh, subtopic 4.4 and wave behavior. Uh, we saw that the separation of the um, intensity maxima for double slit interference was given by an equation. Uh, and that equation made use of um, the small angle approximation. So it's important to keep that in mind. And that's the fact that um, when we measure the angle uh, in radians, um, for very small angles, theta is uh, approximately equal to um, sine theta, which is also equal to tan theta, and that gave us uh, an equation. Um, so I'll just restate it here. So the equation there was S is equal to lambda capital D on lowercase d. S is the distance on the screen from the central maximum to the first order maximum. Lambda being the wavelength, capital D being the distance to the screen, and lowercase d being the separation of the two slits. Moving back now to uh, diffraction gratings, we have a, a fairly significant difference. And that difference is that the uh, separation d, uh, lowercase d, um, is much, much smaller. So since diffraction gratings have much narrower slit separations. Uh, that means that um, the angular um, separation of the bright regions, or the maxima, it's now much larger. and that means that the small angle approximation uh, no longer applies. So we can't use that same equation above when we're dealing with diffraction gratings. Uh, and so we need to go back and um, uh, 
relook at the uh, derivation that we used to come up uh, with that um, equation and uh, rather than applying the small angle approximation we'll leave it in terms of theta and just to very quickly um, uh, refresh your memories about that if we have some uh, slits here from a diffraction grating uh, to get to the uh, the first order bright region or the nth order I should say uh, if we consider these rays of light that are traveling out so due to the geometry of the situation with the, the distance to the screen being so large we can approximate them as being parallel as they leave the slits uh, the slit separation here is that distance d and we know that the angle that they're going to make uh, with that uh, central line is going to be the angle theta now the reason why we get constructive interference is that we know that there's a, a path difference and that's this distance here uh, and that's given by n lambda so in other words um, a whole wavelength or two or three or four wavelengths depending on which uh, maxima we're looking at and note that that would be the same over here as well uh, so that value there would also be n lambda now through geometry we can identify that this angle here is also going to be theta uh, where that's a right angle in there so if we look at that uh, small triangle that we've got um, in this small region here uh, we can identify that um, the value sine theta is going to be the opposite side which is n lambda over the hypotenuse which is d now if we rearrange that to uh, represent the form that's in the data booklet uh, n lambda is equal to d sine theta uh, we did actually see that to, or a version of that when we looked at double slit interference uh, but with the small angle approximation we uh, were able to deal with that sine theta term in a different way here we need to leave that uh, sine theta term as it is uh, just to clarify um, the values that we're using there n is the order of the intensity maximum so that uh, means that if we're looking at the central maximum uh, that's going to be 0 um, and then n equals 1 for the first order either side n equals 2 and 3 and so on uh, lambda is the wavelength of the light and wavelength is always measured in meters usually stated in nanometers but for this equation we need to convert it back to meters d is the, um, the slit spacing or the slit separation and that's in meters as well and then theta is the uh, the angle uh, to the intensity maximum that will usually be measured in degrees um, but might sometimes be stated in radians now we just want to talk about the uh, the value of d here um, we've got there that it's the slit spacing in meters usually with diffraction gratings we're not going to deal with the um, the spacing uh, in terms of how far apart they are um, they're usually stated in terms of the number of lines per millimeter and uh, we can use that to figure out what d is and as an example um, we can use a nice easy um, example here so for example if um, we had 500 lines per millimeter that means that we have uh, a ratio then that um, if we're looking at 500 lines for every one millimeter we can say that the value for D is going to be for every one millimeter there's 500 lines and so that will give us a value of 0 0.00200 uh, millimeters now I'm writing these uh, two zeros in here uh, because we're going to assume that these zeros are significant in the number of lines per millimeter uh, so that gives us the slit spacing uh, but then we would need to convert that into uh, meters and so that would give us a value of 2.00 uh, by 10 to the negative 6 um, meters now one of the key uses for diffraction gratings uh, is about um, being able to disperse light uh, 
Um, we'll talk about that uh, just to finish off. And you might sort of think, well, hang on, we can do that with uh, double slits. Um, but if you recall, with double slits, we have a, a fairly wide um, uh, intensity maximum or the, the bright band. Uh, with uh, diffraction gratings, that bright band is much smaller, and so we won't get so much overlap of different colors. Um, and so uh, much more useful uh, application uh, with a diffraction grating than it is just with double slits. And the reason uh, why we get that effect occurring uh, is because of the relationship uh, between wavelength and the angle because lambda is directly proportional to sine theta. So when we have a, a greater wavelength, we're going to see a greater deviation of that uh, particular color. Uh, and to give that as a, a better example, let me just um, include a couple of images here. So on the left, we have the, uh, the diffraction grating here, and you can see that we have white light that's shining onto that diffraction grating. Uh, through the middle, you can see that bright central maximum, and then the, uh, the first order maximum uh, on one side and then the first order maximum on the other side and notice that the light has been divided up into its uh, component colors so you can see there that the uh, the wavelength of light that's the shortest is blue light at this end and then the longest is red light at the other end now on the right hand side we have the uh, interference pattern as it would be seen on the screen so imagine we've got a screen placed on this end of this um, setup uh, the interference pattern you would see would look like that on the right hand side. So here's the, uh, the central maximum for white light um, and then you can see the first order maximum on either side and then likewise the second outside that and then the third even wider. Notice that as we uh, move further out that the, um, those bright bands for the second and third order maxima they increase in width. That's because if you think about the distance from uh, the central to the red that's going to double and then triple and so that it gets much further out. Whereas for the blue, when it doubles, uh, the, the fact that it was smaller to begin with means that we get a, a greater and greater separation as we move out to the second and third order maxima. On the top of that image is what it would look like for monochromatic light, so in this case green light. You can see there that the, uh, the width of each of these bands is fairly narrow and the intensity is quite bright. Uh, note also that uh, the intensity of the pattern still decreases as per uh, single slit diffraction, as we mentioned earlier. Now, in order to produce a discernible uh, interference pattern, so that means one that we can actually see the, uh, the separation of colors and can make some measurements from, um, we need to consider the uh, wavelength of the light and the separation of the, the slits that are being used. Um, and so it's not really going to produce an interference pattern for any combination of um, slit width and uh, wavelength. They need to be uh, carefully sort of calibrated, I suppose. Um, the slit spacing or the slit separation, that's the value D, um, must be comparable um, to the wavelength. By comparable, we don't need, mean that it um, needs to be exactly the same, just that it um, is in the same sort of uh, ballpark figure, so no more than say, uh, I don't know, a factor of 10 uh, bigger or smaller. Um, and as a, an example, let's imagine um, we're considering uh, n being equal to 1, and we want the uh, interference pattern uh, to be no wider than about 45 degrees. Uh, so that means if we look at the equation n lambda is equal to d sine theta, uh, substituting those two values, so n is equal to 1, so that term effectively disappears. Uh, that leaves us with d sine 45 degrees. Uh, so lambda is equal to d multiplied by 0 0.707. So that means that the, uh, the spacing uh, needs to be about 1.41 uh, times the wavelength. So in order to get that 45 degree separation of the first order bright region from the central bright region, um, the spacing of the, uh, the slits needs to be 1.41 times the wavelength. If you know what that value of D is, then you can determine how many lines per millimeter are needed in the diffraction grating. Now, earlier I mentioned um, 600 lines per millimeter as being a, a fairly typical diffraction grating. That's because the slit separation matches up well with visible light. It's about four times the wavelength of visible light uh, and so it tends to work well for dispersing visible light. 
Now diffraction gratings are going to come up again when we move on to 9.4 on resolution. Uh, so make sure you've got a good understanding of what they are, how they work and why they're important.